Heather McDonald has got the juices scoop. When you're on the road, when you're on the go, Juicy Scoop is the show to know. She talks Hollywood tales, her real life Mr. Sacred Serial Data, and Serial Sister. You'll be addicted and addicted fast to the number one tabloid real life podcast. Listen in, listen up. Woo woo. Heather McDonald. Juicy Scoop. Hello, and welcome to Juicy Scoop. I have comedian, fellow mother, grandmother, hilarious woman, Leanne Morgan. Thank you for coming on the show. I'm so tickled <laughs> to be here. Um, I describe you as just everything you say is funny. I don't know if it's just, where are you from? What is this accent from? I'm from a town of 500 people that grows dark fire tobacco in Middle Tennessee outside of Nashville on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. That was very specific. <laughs> You can you tell me people ask me, I mean, can you tell that people ask me that all the time? I guess. So I get it down to, yeah. So you are a very successful stand-up comedian, and I discovered you because you were showing up all over my Facebook page a couple years ago, and then I was doing a show, and this guy's like, oh, I use the same social media people that do Leanne Morgan. I'm like, my God. So I paid these guys. I'm like, can you do what you did for Leanne Morgan? And it did not work. It did not work. Oh my my stand-up did not go at... I. The only viral stand-up clip I have is when I fainted on stage. I don't have any... Uh, thank God for the podcast. <laughs> and thank God for people that, that are Juicy Coopers that come to see my show. But I don't have these moments that you you are... It's just, you're so funny, and I think it's just so relatable. And every time you come across my thing, I, like, sit and watch it. Oh, you angel. I, Thank you, my um, darling. And my sister went to go see you in, what casino were you on? Uh, Palm Springs? Morongo. Morongo. And, um. In Palm Springs? Yeah, she had a lot of fun. She went with a bunch of girls. Oh. Well, let me say that, see, to me, you're one of the cool kids in the cafeteria, and that means so much <laughs> to me, because I've been doing comedy for over 20 years. But I was living in Knoxville in Texas and trying to do comedy and raise three children. And I always knew who you were. And for you to say that about me means the world to me. Because, see, I see you, L.A., cool kid, cafeteria, you know everybody, everybody knows you. And I always wanted that. And I begged their daddy to move to L.A. when they were babies. I said, let's sell everything and I'll cook on a hot plate. And he was like, they, or what are you, crazy? We need health insurance. And he's always been an executive for a company. And anyway, so we didn't go. But when, okay, let's talk about your life a little bit. Well, I was born and raised here, so I had that advantage. So I oh. did. And when I started doing stand-up, everyone would say, well, you can't start doing stand-up in L.A. You got to go somewhere, get your, you know, get your act down, and then try to be a stand-up. And so I came home one day, and I told my dad, I go, I think I'm going to move to Florida. Because at the time they were doing some like, I don't know, there was problem. There's always problems filming here. So that's why like people film in Atlanta and yeah. Canada and everywhere else, but LA. I don't know why. Anyway, who cares? I'm not going to get political. But we don't we don't give anybody a tax break to film here. So they go to the other places, and I was like, they're doing some filming in Florida. I'm going to go do that, and then I'll work on my standup, and then I'll come back. And my dad's like, what? That's the dumbest thing I've. Ever <laughs> He's like, do you even know how hard that is? And I'm like, no, I guess I didn't realize. That it is nice once that's the one thing. Like I knew how to get to the locations of the auditions and whatnot. And I had a home base here. But you, so tell me a little bit about, I've heard little bits and pieces of how you got started in stand up. Just growing up in this tiny town when you weren't fighting off demons, did you know <laughs> that you were like a naturally funny person? Did you watch stand ups growing up and think one day I'd like to do that? Yes, I did all of that. I loved, I, well, I loved all comedy, like Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Carol Burnett, all that. My mom, you know, loved it too, Lucy Arnaz and all yeah. that. And, um, and I just always wanted to be in show business. And I, and people thought I was funny and, and I could tell that I was funny. And yeah. I was, and, but I went, I went to this little bitty country school that was kindergarten through 12, 650 students. And it was big future farmers of America. And I took home ec and learned how to make an omelet instead of doing chemistry. Yeah. And I, and I was worried to death. I had my high school boyfriend and, and I, everybody, a lot, most people in my class got married right out of high school and, and became, it went to their, with their families farming. 
Okay. And But I always knew in my heart, I got to get out of here. I loved where I was raised, but I thought I, something big's going to happen to me. I just knew it. Yeah. And I feel like even at like 10 years old, I feel like God, you know, said to me, you, it's something bigger. And, yep. and then I got to thinking, am I crazy? And I'm like one of these American Idol kids that think they can sing. <laughs> like, I've just gone through that kind of. That, okay, that is so funny. Okay, I so felt. I remember being at my in my school, and and you know, of course, they were going to do like um, the most you know most likely to succeed, like eighth grade yearbook, whatever. And of course, like the smartest girl got it or whatever. And I remember thinking, I'm not going to get it, but I am going to be. Like I kind of was just like knew it like it's something, and I don't even think that I am in that class. I don't know if I'd be considered. I don't know what considered success, whatever. But I was always like, mm, you know, like like there was something. It's interesting. A lot of people say that, like when they kind of knew it and it's almost like, oh, I don't want to be boastful. I don't want to say it out loud. I don't want to, you know, that kind of a thing. But then when it happens, you're like, well, I did always kind of manifest it or know it or know I had a gift. Mm -hmm. um, type yes, of that's thing. how yeah. I feel. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so then, so did you marry the high school sweetheart? I did not, but I followed him to the University of Tennessee. Okay. And. Um, he broke up with me in about three weeks after we were there because he was, you know, drunk in a fraternity party. And I was coming off of the Adams United Methodist Youth Fellowship and okay. I nagged him uh, because I was like, what is this Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. And he broke up with me. Okay. And then I grieved and sat in my dorm room and watched TV and cried over Perina dog commercials. You know, yeah. I was a wreck. Yeah. And then I got out and started clubbing and, you know, and went through horrible sin, did horrible things, made horrible decisions in the 80s. Did you bone And I'm saying did that you, in front of my did children. Did you bone a lot of guys? No. Oh. No, but I made out. I made okay. out with a lot of people and I did you dry let hump? them treat did me you dry terrible. Hump? Dry hump? Probably. I should say that. <laughs> are you going to let people know? My children are in here. They're grown women, but yeah, I... <laughs> I and I think and I really messed with people's heads. Like I really tried to torment men. I did. I mean, I was you know well, I knew I had power over them. Well, you know, my book is called "You'll Never Blue Ball in This Town Again." Oh, I remember when your book. Yeah, because I was a big dry humper. <laughs> I was an old virgin big dry humper. Were you? Yes. Well, and I, I and I and I and these guys all they, I dress slutty. I drank. <laughs> They all thought they were going to get laid. And then by the third date, never heard from them again. <laughs> but I got on some nice, got some nice meals. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, I'm being. Yeah. Well, and I was going <laughs> to say, you being raised here, yeah. I know that um, you were saying, oh, you got to make, you got to go and do comedy and get your act somewhere else. But, but yeah. it, it, it was, I think, being raised here, it's probably what kept your weight down. I mean, you've got a beautiful <laughs> body. And I've been watching you in your combo pictures and your Thank bikini you. because you've had how many children? Two. Lord. Nobody looks like that in a bathing suit. Well, maybe these L.A. girls. Well, I, you asked if I was athletic, and I am not. So I was always last picked on the team. Did you do ballet? You look like a dancer. Your legs. No. I just, I just kind of like, I like to dance. Like, I like to have fun. And I do like stay fit and I do Pilates and stuff now. And I Pilates. Yes. And I'm just, you know, but I've I, I've been lucky to uh, like, you know, just kinda of have like good genes or whatever. And I just good try. I just try. Yeah. I try to be cute, you know. I like <laughs> it. I like it. But well, you uh, are cute. Thank so you. So cute. Thank you. Mm. So okay, so you you are blue balling men and you're drinking and smoking. Dr smoke cigarettes. And I wasn't then, a big drinker, but I smoked cigarettes and drank coffee and and uh, Diet Coke and yeah. tried to torment people. And okay, so then um, then what happens? Then when do you start? Then when did you get married? Yes. So you, uh, well, I might as well tell you everything. All right. So yeah. I married. I married the first time at twenty one. Oh, you had a starter marriage. I had a starter, and I and I said this too. <laughs> Little Tony Horton, while we were exercising, I was out of breath. Okay, so I I think when I went to UT, I think I always wanted to be in Hollywood. Yeah. I always thought, this is crazy. I don't, okay, I'll go to college, whatever, but I'm going to be a star. Yeah. You know, but my, my family, 
you know, they were like, you need to either go to college or in the military. And I was like, what? I can't make it in the military. And I just, I didn't have the guts to come out here. I always told my dad, if they ever draft women, I'll just get pregnant. That's how much I didn't want to go to the military. Oh, Lord. I could not make it. Yeah. So but, go on. So I, um, so, and I, and I was, you know, I had these, all that my friends were getting married right out of high school. But anyway, I went to college and then my high school boyfriend and I broke up and I think I was just. I was taking classes, but I wasn't doing well. I was flailing around in college. And I and I really think that I married this man to, to because I didn't know what else to do. Because I was lost and I didn't know what else to do. Did you know walking down the aisle that you shouldn't I marry him? I knew it was him? a terrible mistake. Did you have a big wedding? It was big for little Adams. Yeah. You know, it was in my church and there was mints and nuts afterwards. But yeah. it wasn't that big. Of, no, yeah. it wasn't like now how big yeah, yeah. my son had. but. But in my mind, back then at 21, I thought, oh, my mom and dad have paid for all this and the dress and all that. And I and I just, but I knew it was a horrible mistake. And he was a beautiful, talented somebody, but he was very mentally ill. And, you know, back then. What did in how, 80, how was he? Bipolar. And he took his own life about probably five years ago. And so had a how long, family. So how long were you married? For? I was only married to him for about two and a half, three years. And I left in the middle of the night. Because oh. he was mean, but you know, yeah. I look back on it, and I didn't, I didn't know what bipolar was. Right. Or, you know, back then I just thought he's crazy, he's mean, and yeah. all that. But anyway, I left, and I went back to school, and got my degree, and I met their daddy while we were waiting tables. He was getting an MBA. Okay. And I was, get, I was finishing up this undergraduate. It took me years, <laughs> because I'm so unorganized. Anyway. Okay. Uh, the whole time, all of this happening, thinking I'm going to make it in show business. I don't know where. I don't know and, how. And, but are you? But you're not. I'm not doing anything. But are you thinking it's stand up? Are you thinking you should be a star at a sitcom? Are you trying to do a play? Sitcom, in Tennessee, or what? sitcom, comedy, stand up. But but I really. I mean, I watched Jay Leno. Yeah. Everybody on Johnny Carson, Roseanne, when she debuted on. Now, Johnny Carson, like, and that, it blew me away. The fact that you were doing this and you weren't pursuing that, was that difficult for you? Like, like you're like, I got a gift from God and I'm not using it. Like, when am I going to have the balls to start to do something with this? Was that like um, torturing it all? It wasn't gnawing at me. It okay. really wasn't because I knew I wanted to be a mama and I, more than anything. Yeah. I wanted to be a mama and I wanted babies. And yeah. so... But I was still kind of flailing around. Anyway, my, my husband and I met, and then he moved me to, this is, I, I know God had his hand on me the whole time. All right, so my husband had never stepped foot in a mobile home, went and played golf with his daddy and a little crusty man named Fran that had a refurbishing business, refurbished used mobile homes, glamorous. And then resold them to people, okay. like on a car lot. Okay, well, my husband, this little old man said, I'm going to retire. This has been very lucrative. I'm going to sell this business. My husband bought that business. Now, we weren't married yet. He moved on to Bean Station, Tennessee, which is in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We got married, moved me up there. I got pregnant with my first baby, Charlie, who's now, now wait, 29. Isn't the Appalachians like where people have, like... Is it like Heather? Isn't it like like are there Mountain documentaries or, about yes, there are. people that yes. and they like marry their brother and There's they a, like they have like weird ailments because they marry their brother and they have like teeth like Deliverance. Remember with yeah. Burt Reynolds. Okay, so the Appalachians go from Georgia to Maine, and I don't think people realize that. So there are some a stretch yeah. of the Appalachians where people really and truly don't know who the president is. Yeah. It is so. Obs you know, yeah. and now and those sweet people like opioids when you see did yeah. you ever see um oh the dope sick? Dope yeah. sick. Yeah. We're talking about like yeah. you know the yeah. southeastern Kentucky, all up in there. Right. So so it this was in Bean Station, which is very pretty, lakes, mountains, beautiful. Okay. But but rural. Yeah. And I'm from rural, but not that rural. Yeah. Like my people know who the president is. Yeah. Anyway, he moves me up there and I'm thinking, Oh my Lord, what has happened? Okay, so I have my first baby, Charlie. Yeah. Who, you know, when you have your first baby and I nursed him. And I mean, I, I thought, I don't need anybody else. I've got this precious baby. And I told my husband, I go, I don't, I, if I don't want to put him in daycare, I don't want to work. I'll do without. 
I just want this baby. And then, I, of course, I needed my hair highlighted. And we had this small business, and we were young. I mean, like 27, you know, 28. And so I wanted to make a little. I've always had a side hustle. I've always had some way to make money. So I, my friend in Nashville said, I'm selling this jewelry like women sell Mary Kay and right. Tupperware. And she said, you ought to do it, Lynn. You can meet people. You can make a little money. Chuck can take care of the baby while you're having these parties. And I don't even, I don't even care about jewelry. I really don't. And I, and it's just bizarre to me that I even did it. And I started doing these jewelry parties in women's houses. And I, and I was supposed to be talking about jewelry and how like a, an, a clip on can change the look of a pump. Yeah. And instead I a talked clip about. on your shoe. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I, it was very not. Co- they didn't call it costume, but it was you yeah, know yeah. like nineteen ninety nine for a pair of earrings. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, instead I was talking about breastfeeding and hemorrhoids and my and resenting Chuck because he didn't hear the baby in the night, and I developed an, a a shtick. Yeah, and I and I look back on it and I think there was no comedy clubs, but I had it was like my own little comedy club with my demographic every night, right. women that were going through the same thing I was going through, and. I started booking a year in advance because people would say, she's funny. You need to have a jewelry party with her. Well, we, so we, fun. We, would they at least buy some jewelry from oh, you? Oh, I sold a buttload okay, of jewelry. Good. And I, we ate dip and brownies and we had a ball and people had fun. Now, did you have people under you selling the yes, jewelry? Yes, then I had women oh, so and I was be, not a good leader. I so, was not a good leader. So then you were part of the pyramid system. Like yeah, kind of like marketing. Lulu Row. Yeah. But it wasn't twisted. It really wasn't. It was sweet. <laughs> It was sweet people. It was a Christian company out of Dallas, and it was a little old Aren't they all Christian man. companies? But that's good. Yeah. Well, yeah. But they were sweet, and it gave me something to do, and I felt yeah. good about it. And so I, how long did you do that for? Uh, until I got pregnant with my third baby, and I thought, I can't be schlepping all this jewelry around. Because okay. it was getting too hard then. But I did it while I was pregnant with my second one, because I remember breastfeeding her and on in on in the toilet at Opryland Hotel in Nashville, and then handing her over to my mama so that I could go on stage. Because the what happened was I started booking so far in advance that the company asked me to start speaking at their big things. Oh right! So then I would do these big things, and women would come up to me, and there would be now, hundreds would they of women. Pay you? Would they pay you extra? No, no, they would just say, "Can you talk about how you get booked so far in advance?" Oh. And I and then I'd get up there and talk about breastfeeding and hemorrhoids. And women would say, you need to be a stand-up. You are so funny. And that gave me the the strength and the courage. But I can remember in my twisted mind, while I'd be doing these jewelry parties, I would say to these women in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, you can book a party with me now or you can see me in Las Vegas later. It's up to y'all. Because I knew in my head, I'm going to be in Las Vegas. I'm going to be on TV. Yeah. I remember thinking that, which how crazy is that? It's but not, let me tell it's, you. It's, be, it's believing in yourself. It's not bad. But I always talk about the secret, you know, about the secret of manifesting things. And I just kind of discovered that, you know, shortly after, like, Oprah featured the people and you saw that weird video that, you know, everyone was talking about the secret. And I then realized, ooh, I would do that. I would. I used to do stuff like that without even knowing. And I never made the board. I never did the, the board. I would yeah. just kind of say it or sometimes I wouldn't say it out loud. I'd just say it in my head or whatever. And um, yeah, it's so it's so true. So I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, it's just I think in our generation, um, at least with me, people were so mean if they thought someone was conceited. So it's like, oh, she thinks she can be a model. Like people are really mean. Totally different because now every kid is glamming them as, as all every kid's conceited. Every kid has their own TikTok, their own and they're taking their own selfies. But in our day, that was like. That was bad to think so highly of yourself, don't yeah. you think? Yeah, I get, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I didn't even think about that, but yeah. 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 But I remember coming, before Chuck and I married, I came at, we came out here to see my sister. She lived in Huntington Beach. Oh, that's nice. And um, worked for a company. And I remember saying to him, I want to go to the comedy store and I want to watch comedians because I just loved them. And we, I saw Don Marrera and Paul Con Mooney. Sunset? Uh-huh. You went, okay, uh-huh. uh-huh. And I remember my heart beating out of my body, standing in line. And I, I, and it was like a physical thing, like, I'm supposed to be doing this. And I remember watching them and thinking, I can do this, I can do this. And this and was what before was we this? married. 
That would have been in like 91, 92. Oh, so then you did had all the babies. You did the selling the jewelry. Jewelry and all so that. So then when was the first time you actually went on a club after you established the act selling the jewelry? Okay. I was, I had, uh, my baby child was 18 months old and I called Zanies in Nashville and asked Brian Dorfman, who is now my concert promoter. Nice. Um, I, and that, she was 18 months old. She just turned 25. So I said to him, I, I know you don't know me, but because by then I'd quit selling jewelry and I was like the person in Morristown, Tennessee that would do like the rotary. Like if you needed somebody to come and do 20 minutes and I dropped my babies off at preschool and I, I called myself a comedian, oh, even so though I'd getting, never yeah, been yeah. on. So then I got, I asked him, can I come and open? And I opened for Billy Gardell. Yeah. And I did 10 minutes, and I'm sure I sucked. But anyway, I went back, and the he took me back in the office, and he said, what do you want to do? And, and he goes, because I think you've got some. And I, and I said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it, and I'm going to be a sitcom star, and I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to make it. I, and he, um, he said, Lynn, there's no way you can go out here and do these clubs and raise these three children. He said that you cannot do it. Roseanne, he said this to me. He goes, yeah. Roseanne raised hers in a station wagon in the parking lot and it didn't turn out well now i don't know what happened with her i don't know but he's i remember him saying that to me and i remember getting angry and thinking you're not going to tell me what to do i can to make it and we, he and i've talked about it several times i go you know what you were right like i couldn't have raised them to be who they are today if i had have gone on the road and just not like, I know people who've done it, women. It's not many, you know, because it's no, so it's, hard. It's really not. And, you know, um, kind of when I was, like, you know, trying to get more people, like, interested in my stand-up, I, I was like, honestly, besides you, I go, there's no other female comic who's currently married who is raising kids that are not babies. Like, there's... Ali Wong and there's, you know, a bunch that have little kids, Amy Schumer and that are doing it. But I'm like, there's nobody that's like doing it now. And I go, and I think that's like what makes it unique. But I was lucky, too, in that I wasn't on the road leaving my kid. Like I was able to establish my comedy in other ways by being on TV shows and writing books and and all of that. So. I would leave for the weekend when my kids were school age and I'd leave my kids with my husband. But right. I was not gone for weeks on end making or ten dollars. Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Making ten dollars to try to get that act. And that's where depending on the kind of, you know, parent you're comfortable being with as a woman, that is why you see less women doing it. Because essentially there's all different ways to make it, especially today. I don't think there's that the strict way that people say that you have to do every night. You got to go up five times. I don't really believe that you did it differently. I did it differently and we're both successful. So I don't think you have to do it, but you know, it it's, but a guy, most men are very happy to leave their toddler for four nights and go on the road. Yeah. And they've I'm got sorry. a wife at home and, that's so, got groceries. And, and you know. nobody says anything about him because he's providing, but the woman it's, you know, even my mom said to my friends, you know, she's never with those kids. I love my mom, rest in peace. But she did tell my friend that. Oh, she wow. did. Well, <laughs> I mean, I forgive her, but I was like, you know, and she always praised my husband, you know, that he was like, but he was having a great life being not working full time. He didn't have the stress of it. It worked out between us. Nobody was suffering. Everybody got to do what they want to do. But people are very weird and critical of it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like I, at a certain point, I remember saying like at Chelsea lately, like when everyone was like giving me make kind of kind of like making fun that my husband was the stay at home dad. And I was like, I wanted so badly to be like, so to the men. So your wives are losers. Like, I mean, are you <laughs> kidding me? Or, or would it be better if he was a traveling attorney and we just had a nanny that didn't give a shit about our kids would would that make us better like it's like people are you know and that's why he said that you know like i think he was like oh you're so talented too bad you have children to raise yeah I, and he and we've talked about it lately i mean yeah. brian and i are very close and and i said 
you know, I just need, it motivated me to find another way. I just yeah. had to find another way. Yeah. And, but I, we moved to Texas right after that. Yeah. And my husband went to work, sold that company, that business and went to work for a large mobile home company. Yeah. And he was over South Texas. And so I moved to San Antonio, which was not really a comedy town. Yeah. I performed in San Antonio too. LOL. The, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is was was fun, but I, I that's think, darling. Yeah, but 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 when I moved there, it was at the mall. Yeah, river. Yeah, I remember that something. Yeah, and um and I did an open mic for the first time. It scared me to death. And the manager came up. God love him, but he had like managed a Fridays, a TGI yeah. Fridays, and he was like, "Don't do any crowd work or don't do any." I, and I remember thinking, "Oh, they know what they're talking about." They really did. But yeah. anyway, I was. <laughs> I, I, that club I went and I did late night. I'd get up at, yeah, at, on stage at midnight. I had little children that got up at six in the morning and I would be, you know, everybody be high on marijuana and I'd be talking about doo doo on the t ball field. And, but I was different and I think, and I stood out right. because ever all these male comics all did Arnold Schwarzenegger yes. impersonations. And I was just different from everybody. Right, yeah. And so I would get things that other people didn't get. And then, uh, I mean, like, you know, I'd get invited to a festival or something. So then I started driving back and forth to Cap City Comedy Club in Austin. Right. And Margie Cole ran it, and she believed in me. And I would do Chick Stick that night, 10 minutes, and she believed Meaning in me. the only girls could do it. Chick yeah, stick. it was like they, they had it on Wednesday night. Yeah, of course, because you you got to have all the girls together because no one wants to see a female comic, right? Yeah. You know what I would always say to my, my audience? And they'd say, oh, I'm coming to see you. And they've gotten better now because I've scolded them. And they'd write me thinking they're being nice. I'm coming to see you tonight. I'm dragging my husband. And I said, you know, you're not helping the cause. Why are you thinking that your husband won't find me entertaining? If you find me entertaining... That means he married a funny woman. So he will enjoy it just as much. If, let me just, you know, I'm like, if he got brought home tickets to Chris Rock and said, we're going to go see Chris Rock Friday, you're telling me that you wouldn't be thrilled, that you wouldn't get your hair done? I'm like, why is that? <laughs> what? And I think some of it is women think, because there's a lot of female comics that are maybe higher profile than us, that male bash mm-hmm. and that are like, you know, super left and male bash. And if their husband is not that, they think, oh God, this is going to be uncomfortable for him because we all care about the man and his ego and that he's having a good time. It's just the way we are. And I think they think, oh God, you know, (laughs) if she is like, whatever, I'm not even going to say a name of somebody that's like that, then he won't have a good time. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, and trust me that like that won't happen because I know that the men love it. And after I like said it out loud, like I get so many more like couples and straight men that are like loving it. Having a ball. But I feel I like so early on in our, in our careers too, even before we made it, the male executives felt they had to market it. I remember there was a whole night of just female driven sitcoms all in one night. Like what? Like it was just so weird. And like, mm-hmm. and that they think that, there's no way that unless we live your life, I can't find you funny. I'm like, well, then how do I find Chris Rock funny? And how do I find Dave Chappelle funny? Right. So why right. couldn't someone who's not a female who's a mother find you funny? Like, yeah. it's just. I even had a man at a big theater on my first tour, the big panty tour. I had him. He came out and did announcements, you know, of the, you know, if there's a fire or whatever, yeah. turn your cell phones on. And then he said, well, I know you men got dragged here. And my heart dropped. And I and it was one of the first shows I did on the Big Panty Tour. And I was already freaked out because it was the biggest thing that yeah. ever happened to me. And it was in 2000 and well, after the pandemic got better. Yeah. And um, and I remember I called the um, my manager and said, I cannot believe that he just introduced me or introduced this tour by saying, and I know you men got all dragged here. And it was a theater I'd sold out in, I can't remember, somewhere. Um, but, I mean, you know, I don't know what it was, 1,200 seats. And I was like, that I'm didn't so, set me up well. I'm, I'm so glad that you said something because <clears throat> I'm sure there's been times that you didn't. And, like, I hadn't, or same thing. And I remember I was like, 
I thought, you know, I'd get some guy to open for me. And the, this guy did a whole thing. I remember it was Aspen. A whole thing about um, what it's like to screw a woman over 40. At this time, I'm over 40. This is Aspen. This is people over 40 that can afford Aspen. And it's all like, oh, they're grateful or they're dry down there. I could not. <laughs> and I'm like, and I have to, and this is my show. But my, I trusted my agent, who I still, you know, like, and, you know, to pick somebody. And then he ends up, and he goes, now I'm going to bring out my really good friend. We just met backstage. I was just like, and after that is when I was like, I will never just get the Anybody. local unless I, unless you send me video and stuff mm -hmm. and I can make sure and I can tell you, don't be dirty. Don't do this. Mm -hmm. And even when I've done that, I've had people backlash and say, oh, she told me I couldn't be dirty because she's such a, she's so insecure in her career. I'm like, I don't need you talking about anal <laughs> at seven o'clock before I come out. Like. Like, no, I don't oh, know. Like, I, if I, can, I, if I don't talk about that, but I, if I get a little dirty, the opener shouldn't be dirty. I don't right. think that's unheard of. Right. But I think some of these guys just immediately think that, oh, you know, mm -hmm. and I've had that too. And, but yeah. let me tell you what my manager would say before I did this yeah. big panty tour and picked who I wanted when I would do the clubs. They would, and I was selling, I started selling out all over the United States. Couldn't get arrested, you know, for years. Nobody yeah. would book me. And then they were like, all, all of a sudden, you know, I was in demand and selling. And they, and he said, she needs somebody clean. And um, they automatically thought, I don't know why, but let's get a woman in her 60s in community theater who wears, not even Birkenstocks. I don't even know what you would call those shoes. And somebody that like would get up and sing opera or or do something bizarre. Yeah. And I, and they thought I guess because I'm a middle aged woman that I they had to get another woman. That's it. Yeah. Who I, was a you know a kook. Oh my god. I had the kookiest women. God love them. But you know I mean just bizarre. <laughs> And also, why you you don't need a woman? Like I'm, I don't I'm not, need a woman. I'm not trying to take jobs from men. I want someone different than me. Right. I just don't want him talking about. We ended up uh, having to say, yeah. All right, we'll take a man. But I've had, I at Moon Tower at Moon Tower yeah, Comedy yeah. Festival, they said, they said they said Leanne needs somebody clean to open for her. They gave a list of women. I, they always put women with me, but a list of women, and somebody came and did. I mean the filthiest stuff, I've, and that I guess that was our, their idea of clean. You know, <laughs> somebody's idea of clean's different than my idea of clean, I guess. But she she did, and I loved her. I thought she, I mean, as a person, I loved her. But I thought, is that who they put? You you have to have who you want. You can't. Yeah, now there's you, no gas in it anymore. Right. Yeah, which was why I was telling you when I came in here, I'm in love with Chris Prinjola. Yes. I love him with you, and I know that he opens for Fortune yeah. some, and he, I just think he's so funny. He's great. Oh. He's great. We've been friends for a long time, and yeah, I love him to death. Oh, he's yeah. so darling. Yeah. And so, okay, so when, um, so when you started to, like, really make it, did you, I believe that someone sent me, did you have a script or a sitcom deal? Yeah, I've had several. Oh, okay. And what happened Over with Over the years, um, which I think kept me in this, you know, when I would be kicked down and I'd get no's and nobody cared. Because I think about Comedy Central never wanted me. You know, when to do back in that, mm -hmm. uh-uh. Yeah. I mean, for years, like Cap City Comedy Club in Austin would put me up for something. I never got that kind of stuff. Now I'd get Funniest Mom in America, things yeah. from Nick at Night and stuff like that. But Oh, what, you did that? Uh, I did it the first year. And then Sandra who? Bernhard was the... Okay, Host. and then wasn't um, who were some other people that was on with you? The on with me would have been like the a, woman that won it. I'm always the bridesmaid, never the bride. I didn't win it. Darlene Westgore won it the oh. year I did it. Um, there were funny people on it. I think I, I mean I watched it because I was just getting back into comedy. Like I didn't do stand up. I did stand up in my twenties, and then I stopped at. Oh, here's why I stopped doing it. So I got a deal a TV deal about my life and I was 30 and my manager at the time 
said, don't do stand up because if for some reason you bomb in LA, it's going to look bad that you have a deal. And anyway, and I also never really bombed. I mean, I would have better nights, but I never was like crickets or <laughs> and nothing like that. And so I was just like, okay. And so then I kind of stopped doing it. And then I always lived far from the clubs and I was never a regular at a club. So then I just let, a, like, then I basically didn't do it for a bunch of years. And um, for the same reason, like, I'm like, oh, to go and waste five hours, like downtown or whatever. Oh, and, I don't know how y'all do it here. I don't know how y'all do all that. Well, I don't really do the clubs here. So yeah. like, because of the same thing, I would just rather go do stand up somewhere else. But, but I did back then, you know, and, um, but okay. So when, um, so what happened with all your deals? Were you, did you ever the, get close to having first a sitcom? One, I think the first one was probably, well, the second one was pretty close too, but just different things happened. All right. The first one was with ABC and Warner Brothers. And I did a, at the Laugh Factory, I did a showcase in front of a bunch of executives. And ABC bought it before we got out of the parking lot. They wanted Paula Dean to play my mother. I went and met her. We hit it off. She said yes. And uh, the writer's strike hit. Uh -huh. And it ended. Within a day. And I, I, I think I went into a clinical depression. You mean your show ended within a yeah, day? Yeah, they oh. said it's over. The okay. writer strike hit. We're not doing anything. It's dead. Okay. And I didn't know how Hollywood worked. Right. And I, and I really, in my heart, thought this is it. I'm going to be a sitcom star. And I didn't realize how, you know, it's easier to win the lottery than it is to get a television show on there. Right. So I thought, oh, this is it. And then it ended in a day. And they were like, it's over, Lynn. And I had been, you know. Traveling all over. They would send me to go with Paula to open for her to do all this stuff. I was back and forth to L.A. And then they were like, it's over. So my husband bought me a beagle in Ogden, Utah, trying to make it up to me. And, and I love that dog. And he's an old little man now. And he's been the best dog we've ever had. But I remember just being in, just staying, you know, sitting, staring into space. And that little precious beagle would just sit and look at me and pee in the floor. And I just thought. No, what is it? I mean, my life is over. And then, uh, not my life is over because I had these precious children. Well, then I get the second deal. But could not. I was on a tour called the Southern Fried Chicks. I don't know if you ever heard about that. Yeah, us. yeah. Is that where you were? And tr that's what Trish did. Trish sure did yeah, that? She yeah, she did it after I did oh, okay, it. all right. But I was one of the original ones. Yes. And, and they were going to shoot a special for CMT. And I, I couldn't do it because I had this deal with ABC. They didn't want me to do it. And so I, because yeah, God forbid you have more exposure to get people excited to possibly watch your show. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that make sense? Uh -uh. Okay. Go on. And then, so, um, <laughs> yeah, but that's how I met Trish. Oh, yeah. But I, that, but Southern Fried Chicks was wonderful for me because it was on the weekends in small theaters. Yeah. And, it, and I was really the opener for the other two that were very seasoned. Yeah. Professional comedians. But it was, it was a good way for me to get that time on stage. Yeah. It was from heaven. Really. And that was about three years. We did 50 dates a year. And I never had to hire anybody to take care of these kids. Chuck would be with them on the weekends. Yeah. I could take them to school during the week. And I didn't work every weekend. But right. anyway, and then um, I got a, and then I couldn't, it's like that deal came. I thought I'm going to be the next Roseanne. Then it was over. Then couldn't get booked. Was just begging anybody if I could, you know, do the, um, I was your big fundraiser person in Knoxville. Like if you right. needed somebody to come and do a few minutes for the breast cancer fundraiser, yeah. I was your person. Right. So I was doing that kind of stuff. Felt like it was over. But then, you weren't making like good money. I was making pretty good money. Oh, pretty good money. So you're, okay. you know, a few thousand a night to do okay. these things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then all out of the blue, I get a uh, Fremantle that did American Idol. Yeah said, we'd like to do a sitcom with her, and we want to put her with Matt Williams, who created Roseanne and Home Improvement. They want to do a show with him on Nick at Night, like the Cosby show and, and all okay. those kind of shows. And so I met Matt Williams. We fell in love, darling. And he said, yes, I'll do it for her. And we he came to Knoxville, met my family, built this sitcom around me. And then Nick at Night, he called me and he said, Lynn, you're going to have to trust me. Nick at Night, want, I think, wants to make this into like a children's show, like Disney. Not mm. not a sitcom like... Yeah, like Cornwall George Ball Lopez. City. Yeah, yeah, like Possum Loose in the Living Room is what he called it. A, a possum Gets Loose, loose in the, the Living yeah, Room. Yeah, that would be the big funny moment. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. he said, I'm not doing that. And you got to trust me, I got to take it back. So he took it back from Nick at Night, and that caused a big sting. And then we went to TV Land, and they bought it in the room 
and said, we want to do something, and then held on to it for nine months and then came back and said, she's too traditional. She like she's married to a man. She's got kids. It's just not what year was this? This would have been what year would that have been? Lord, I can't. I have no conception of time. Like ten years ago or like five years ago? Yeah, ten years ago. Okay. Like Modern Family had come out. It was a huge hit. And I understand that. Like I I sold another show. Well, first of all, when the first show didn't go, okay, after that, and it got to like the pilot stage, it didn't go. And so right after they said it's not going to go. I don't remember, they were like, Les Moonves is reading it this weekend and blah, blah, blah. It was with CBS. And then they're like, um, they wanted it for Sherry O'Terry to play me because I wasn't famous enough. Famous enough. They were like, maybe you could be the sister. So anyway, she didn't like it. She had a deal with CBS, so she passed on it. And they're like, so it's not going anywhere. And so then I was like, oh, okay. And then I went off the pill. Oh, do we have the other iPad? Pop it on the other one. I'm just going to keep talking. Who cares? Those people <laughs> like to see the behind the scenes stuff. Anyway, so um, so then she, um, so then, but then I, I went off the pill and then I got pregnant right away with my first child. Cause, but if had the show gone, I wasn't going to try to get pregnant. Yeah. So then I had another show, which reminds me of, you know, being, tw- and I thought, um, I met with these people and I thought they were really interested after, it had gone already. They were like, these people, Fox doesn't want it, but maybe USA will want it. After Fox had bought it, they didn't want it. And the guy goes, I mean, again, he's like, I mean, like her family, it's just like too original. I mean, too, too tr- traditional. He goes, like, maybe if you were like, a- I'm not kidding. He goes, maybe if you were like aliens or something. I'm not <laughs> kidding. He said, maybe if you're alien. And I'm like, well, then No. Like, I, I'm not going to rewrite it to be an alien. So goodbye. Okay, so they said that. So then they said, you're too traditional after nine months yeah, of holding. Yeah, and Matt it, Williams time. said to me, who, Matt yeah. Williams, who created Roseanne and Home Improvement. Yeah. And, you know, for Carsey Warner and right, all that. Right, right. He goes, Lynn, I don't know what to tell you. He goes, I, I don't, you know, what do you say to that? He goes, there's always, they, they want to have a hook, like. And so for a while there, we like were it, thinking. Like, it, like you could, like you had to be a lesbian. Yeah, it, or yes, because I'm white. You yes. know, if it would be good if I were an alternative lifestyle. They even talked about like an interactive thing. Like if people could almost rewrite the script as we're going through the. Matt goes, I just don't even know what to do. Okay, I have another. I have another friend of mine who did have a show. Um, I don't even care. I'm just going to tell. It was Fortune. Fortune had a show. And during her time of trying to get her show off the air, they were like, but you, but your family, you know, is all white. So can her being a gay girl? I mean, she's like, yeah, she's herself. She's gay. Yeah. yeah. But the people, but, but that's her family. Like, and so then I remember she was like, so they were saying like, can we cast like your brother's wife to not be a white person and i mean she's like sure anything you want to make the show work right but i remember her telling me this and i go but you know what if you're this southern white family and now your brother's married to this woman who's not white wouldn't there be storylines and discussions about that you could be embracing her it could be great yeah but if we're being honest about a family and a home and how they talk it's not like you would just never acknowledge that your brother is now not married to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, so that kind yeah. of changes this, her life story because right. her, it was based on her life story. Anyway, I think they, I don't know if they ever filmed the pilot or if they just took to the writing stage, but it's that kind of thing where then you're like, and it's why like everyone thinks like, oh, you come up with this sitcom idea or you have this perfect 10 minutes that I can see it. I can see what your sitcom would be from your 10 minutes. But then when you get all these people involved that are like, like I had the, the first time I sold a show, I had I was about a young girl working with her parents in real estate, which is based on my life and based on my stand up. And I had these brothers that were like arrested development brothers. They were like, you know, like 40 and like living at home and da da da. And I remember <laughs> they go, We're gonna make the brothers into one and he's gonna be 18. And I'm like, well then that's not like no offense, it's not a loser. Like it was kind of funny that we had this kind of like 
Like the whole, I'm like, it doesn't even make sense. Uh And then, but at that point I was like, whatever. My deal was like, even if I never even show up, I'm going to get a check. So if they want to sell this dumb watered down, I didn't care. But the second time around when they wanted me to be an alien, I was like, (laughs) you know what? I just don't even care. I don't care. It's like. So anyway, so I know. Then, so, so they, they, they said so all I've that. had four. Yeah. <laughs> and I've loved all the writers and all that, but yeah. then they get to the executives or whatever and they have to check off boxes. So the last yeah. one, they said, You're gonna be married to a Hispanic man, which I've always loved Hispanic men. Yeah. I've always loved Hispanic men and, and my girls know that they're sitting in here. I my grandmother married a Hispanic man who was my step granddaddy who was <laughs> darling and he would talk spanish we to believe her you in love talk and i've always loved his but it's man. not your life story but it's though. not my life story and and, and, and if you were his and if you man were be quiet and, and and if you were married introverted like chuck morgan no a hispanic no. man would be you know we would, would dance have a completely in the kitchen. different life a completely different dynamic you'd have those in-laws it would just change it too much if that's what they want then go get some talented writers and write a story about, uh, you know, a, 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 a white girl who married, but it's right. not your but story. Laura Lenny in it. Yeah. You know, you don't yeah. have to have me. Exactly. But but you're right. They take, they go, we love it, we love it, we love you, we love these kids. But then they wonder that. why these shows don't work. And then they put it into, yeah. you, well, this child is, is this, not, the, not right. how my real... So I don't have storylines for that. I don't, right. I can't write for that. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't, you know, my, that's not who my child is. Right. So now, I mean, yeah, I'd like to have a, I guess I'd like to have a television show, but I mean, you know, and now I'm traveling and I'm, and these live shows are so wonderful that I think don't you my feel goals like, have changed. Don't you feel like even if the offer came to you right now, you'd be like, fuck it. <laughs> if it did and it was somebody that it made sense, maybe. But it would also have to be like, no, I'm not going to give in. Like, I was giving in on things. I remember one of the things in my pilot for the second time around was I met with this uh, this girl. You know, they wanted me to write it with somebody that was actually like a showrunner of other shows. And I was like, that's fine. I liked her a lot. And some of my friends, you know, at Chelsea Lately read it and stuff. And this one guy that I really liked, he's like, I don't feel like this is totally you because there was like a a Xanax reference or something. And I don't take any prescription drugs and I never have. And, but the mom, you know, my character was like, oh, hand me a Xanax. Like, I have a Chardonnay, that's real. But like, oh, hand me a Xanax. Like, let's be a little edgy. Let's, you know, what mom isn't on like drugs or whatever. And I remember (laughs) he said that and I go, I know you're right. I don't know why I just, I don't know why I couldn't tell this woman I didn't want that joke. Like I wasn't, ready to be my complete authentic creative self in that because it was like I didn't have another way of making money and how could you say no to like possibly star in a sitcom right but then you wonder about all the ones that made it and it's like every element has to be there it has to have the great you know has to have the great time slot and all that but then it has to have I remember when I guessed it on Frasier and they were at the lucky lot like there was a um, one of the lots is like thirteen at I think Paramount or whatever, and they were like this is this is the lucky lot because this is like literally I don't know if it was I Love Lucy or whatever every show that was there lasted a lot of years so I'm waiting so they're like oh okay and this is where you're gonna hang out you know you work all week and then you do like a, you know a live audience at the end and we're in this room that's not bigger than this and. There is Kelsey Grammer, and there are the two girls, and there's everybody. And I'm like, don't they, like, have their own dressing rooms? And they're like, no. And I'm like, that's why this show works. Because they're talking about their weekend, and they, they, didn't, they didn't ask for it. That's what they got. That's what, but I'm like, this is why it's the lucky lot. is because they're not all in their trailers or back then on their phones. And that chemistry, you just cannot... It has to be cast right, but then they have to actually love each other, like friends. You I know, wonder, is that like what that. Have happened with Everybody Loves Raymond? Because I read Phil Rosenthal's book. Oh, I've interviewed Phil. Too. You have? Yeah, yeah. And I read his book about how they would come in on the weekend, I mean, during the week and talk about what happened on the weekend. Yeah. And they were all very close. And that with had the to writers, been what yeah. it was. That's what it was. 
I talked to him about it too. And he was just like, it was the, yeah, it was, it was a perfect thing. And I've said that too. It's like, it just, it's lightning in a bottle. And that's why there's only, and then the, after friends made it every year, I'd get tons of pilots. It's friends in Alaska. It's friends <laughs> in San Diego. Everybody was trying to do a different combination of it. But the only one that lasted was friends, mm -hmm. you know, and like, what do you think about TV now? What do you, is there a place for a sitcom? I mean, I know Abbott Elementary, all, people always talk about that. But that's not a, um, that's not a sitcom in front of a live audience. Right. I but don't what even do you, know what shows are in front of a live audience. I don't even know. I don't know. But are people but that's even what doing I, that? But that's what I always imagined my life to be, that I'd be a mom in a sitcom. And I'm kind of like, that doesn't really, that's not my desire anymore. It kind of changed. And you know, and, and like, I don't even know that it would make financial sense, you know, like to do it. And I think that's why some of the biggest um, standups now, like I know Burke Kreischer, all these people have been offered all this stuff. And if it, and you're like, no, they're not doing it because it's like, are you kidding me? He goes on tour and this and that. And, and if it's not going to be what they want, it's like, well, why would you? I also think sometimes, and I've said this too, like, I do think sometimes the stories that we tell as a stand-up, that art form, is better when you're sitting in the audience and imagining what your kids look like than when 13 people get together and cast it, and now we're going to see the story of when the chicken burned. <laughs> it's not as funny. Yeah. And I think everyone wrong. thinks like, oh my God, this is so great, you know? But then they, they have to not then try to, like, I remember Margaret Cho, I read her book. And she got her deal <clears throat> when she was 25 called All American Girl and everything. And here we, and they made her lose all this weight. I need to read that book. And she I became like it. anorexic. And they were like, no, you have to be like the hot girl, which wasn't what made her funny. Like she was this girl from San Francisco who blah, blah, blah. And, um, and then the guy that she paired, that was paired with her to write the sitcom, She's like, he just watched one of my specials and just only one. And then literally took all my jokes from that one special and put it in the sick. I'm like extremely, <laughs> extremely lazy. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, where will the show go like in five years? Mm -hmm. What would and drive a hundred episodes? Yeah. Like, I don't think people think like that, you know? Um, okay. So, so now you're like, okay, so you have all your, so then. So now you just exploded as like, was it the Facebook stuff? What made it like um, that now? Okay. I feel Do like you a lot know of what Dry Bar you. is? Yes. Dry Bar yes. specials. Okay. So in Chris 2000, did one of those. Little Chris Frangela did? Yeah. yeah. That angel did he? Yeah. Oh, I gotta watch his. Yeah, but it has to be clean, right? It has to be clean. Is it run and by I was one of isn't the, it run by like Mormons or something? Yeah. Yeah. And I was one of the first ones. To, I think I was in the second season, and back then they gave you a list of like, do not say these words. If you do, it it'll get. Cut. At the time, it was on a different platform or whatever, yeah. and you would get you wouldn't get as much money. I don't even remember now. Right. I don't think it's like that anymore. Yeah. But so my manager at the time said they want you to do this dry bar. He said nobody's ever heard of it. Nobody will ever see it. He goes, we can get at least it'll be a nice film. You can get clips, so you can get more breast cancer fundraisers so because that's what i was doing yeah and and i knew my boy got married right out of college at 23 and i knew they wanted to have uh babies and i i really was going through a like a crisis in 2018 2019 like this is i don't even know i know it's not going anywhere you're you're going through a career like identity crisis. yeah and i okay. remember saying to my husband i'm gonna maybe i could open up a store in knoxville like a like a hardware store, and I could just sit out in front and dazzle people. And I mean, and I was about in tears, and he was like, What? And then, and I was like, I don't know. It just didn't say nothing was happening. There, it was, a, it was, I was very sad. One time I asked, my, one time I was like, When I was for so long, like things weren't happening either, you know? And I was like, There is it a fine line between positivity and delusion? <laughs> Like, am I delusional? I thought I was delusional. And I thought I was like the the kids on American Isle that think they can sing. I thought, <laughs> am I one of those? Am I, do I think I'm funny and I'm really not? I, I've gone through that. Yeah. And then I think, no, I, no, I. 
So, so you're then, crying to the husband. So and, I told him, I go, I need that job. I yeah. always, I want to do, they were grown. I thought, I'm, I'm going to do something. And he was like, you're losing your mind. And then, so, but I thought they'll have a baby and I'll be, I'll just be the grandmama and I'll help with the baby. And my manager at the time said, why don't you go do this dry bar thing? He goes, nobody's ever going to see it. It was like before it, the, even the first season came out. So I, he said, they're going to give you a little bit of money. So I went and did that and and just like forgot about it and thought nothing's going to, you know, I didn't think anything about it. That aired. I got millions of views, like 50 million views. One of the bits about her being, about the middle child being mean when she was 16 must have resonated with people. That got a lot of, but it did not translate into, I got a lot of gigs. Yeah. But it wasn't great gigs. Like a lot of people, it was still like low paying, you know, we'll pay you $3,500, like corporate things, but you got to pay your travel out of it. And I, I was busy. But were you doing like uh, weekends where you do like five shows at a club and headline it or not I did, really? I did only like a few clubs a year that would book me that loved me and and cared about me, like Cap City Comedy yeah. Club in Austin, Zanies. I didn't do the weekends of Zanies because I couldn't bring in you know, I couldn't sell tickets, but he, Brian would give me a Sunday or a Tuesday night yeah. or something. And, um, but no, nobody, nobody wanted me like that. But I had a show on Sirius XM for a while. Like uh -huh. there was always something God would drop and go, stay in it. And then, yeah. you know, I've had a lot of nifty things happen to me and, and Hollywood stuff, you know, four deals, you know, people yeah. coming out. But anyway, but wouldn't make it. But, um, but so I always felt like I was in the game. Yeah. But at the, around that time, I thought, this is this is crazy. I'm getting older. They, you know, I'm probably going to have a grandbaby. This is nuts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to work at Target or something. And then and my manager, after the dry bar thing, got me in Orlando Improv and a couple of places, Chicago Zanies, and couldn't sell tickets. And they were like, oh, you're one of those dry bar comics. Like, like we're you're not really a comedian, but we're letting y'all come in here because it that had boomed and was very successful and people were loving dry bar, but I don't think it translates into ticket sales. I know it does. It well, didn't for me. Yeah, I mean nobody it, was buying tickets. Yeah, it's really interesting what translates into actually leaving your house and going. Right, and I like, don't it, think dry it, bar people it, were, or even like huge follows, like a follow. Like it's interesting, like these people that have huge Instagram following. Then they start a podcast and they're like, no, I'll like your picture, but I'm not going to listen to you talk for an hour. So not every medium like crosses over. Right. Okay. So, so they were, they would say in Orlando, love her. She doesn't get drunk and fight in the parking lot, but we're not having her back. I mean, yeah. we, you know, she did, can't sell tickets and I was devastated and yeah. I was like, I had a good time. And, and, <laughs> and so then I said to my manager at the time, I said, I'm, I love, I've always loved Jim Gaffigan. There's different people, you know, yeah. I've loved to wa yeah. watch. And I was watching his social media and I said, he's got somebody doing his social media. And I said to my manager, I'm, I think I need to hire somebody to do my social media. And he was like, you can't afford that and you don't need to be doing that. And, but I'd made some money from dry bar and the gigs, you know, I worked like a mule that year, but it wasn't good gigs. Yeah. It wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't like what I'm doing now. And I, and uh, I was very discouraged, but I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna hire these boys that, and I call them boys. They're thirty, and they've got children, darling. But I thought I'm gonna hire these young people that know how to put all this together because I, I was putting up pictures of my dogs, and I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and um, or they had posed something or yeah, you know yeah. for me, I didn't know. Yeah. And so I gave them all my stuff, you know, that I filmed my head, and because I never done anything dry bar wouldn't let us use their special i yeah. couldn't cut that up and use it but anyway i got all my old stuff and gave it to these young guys and i was moving my baby into she was going to school in new york yeah and i and they they started october 2019 they put out a clip about me talking about taking my husband to go see Def leopard and journey and how everybody looked old and people had plantar fasciitis and you know the little yeah. man that rock sing rock and roll got tiny legs okay we were moving her out, and I and we had all these suitcases. We were in this tiny hotel room, and and I said, I looked down, and I could see it was being shared thousands of times. Like I could, I saw something, and I, and I could feel it. I I, I said something's happening, and their dad was like, 
Leanne, quit looking at your phone. The Uber's here. And we got to get these suitcases out because we had to move her into her apartment. And everybody was stressed out over that. And I thought, oh, okay. And <laughs> and then throughout the, you know, putting her stuff in her cabinets and her, you know, in her apartment, I, through the day, like, I thought, oh, my Lord. Like, I've never had anything do yeah. like this. And then and they may have put out another one. I wish I could remember because it was, I'm not kidding, the beginning of October, and it went like wildfire. Yeah, I remember. And like, I, I don't know if women, then they started looking at other stuff I had done. Like, they right. liked Def Leppard and Journey. They looked at other stuff I had done, and within a month, people were, comedy clubs were calling my manager, we want her. Like, people must have started calling the comedy clubs asking for me. Yeah. So I didn't have an agent. Nobody wanted to represent me. We couldn't. My manager begged people to be my agent. And I think he got somebody to be my agent because he owed him a favor. Like people <laughs> passed me up and were like, and I was selling out all over the United States. And they were like, yeah, you know, this mom. I don't know what. I don't know. Because it's men. It's predominantly men. And, and even women agents pass me up. Yeah. Well, that's true, too. And so I don't see it. So they don't see I was, the value. I was going all over the United States selling out. I had checks in a backpack traveling. My husband's like, you're like a drug dealer. You got all this money in your backpack. We didn't even know. It had never happened to me. I did not know how to even handle it. And I was doing first, I was doing like one nighters and I would sell them out. But I think, Heather, that I hit a knee. I know that I, I have gotten to, into a lane that nobody else was in. Yeah. It was like just middle of the United States women who've been raising children. And, you know, I'm pretty clean. I mean, I, you know, have you in yeah. innuendo and stuff. But and it, but I'm not, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a Christian comedian. I'm a, I'm a mainstream yeah. comedian who's a believer. Right. So I'm pretty clean, but I, you know, I go to the edge, but you know, nothing crazy. <laughs> you know, I talk about I prostituted so, myself to their daddy for years so they could have nice shoes and stuff. But yeah. um, but I just have hit something that people I, I, that was a lane, like Jeff Foxworthy says to me. You know, if you can get in a lane that nobody else is in, and I think I did. He told you that. Uh huh. Oh, that's great. And and it has just been crazy. And if you'd have told me this was going to happen to me, because in my idea of of success, I really wanted to be Roseanne, right. Ray Romano. Yeah, me too. Yeah, all that. And 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 so for this to happen for me at fifty, I'm fifty seven. I got a grandbaby, another one on the way. Because my new tour is called Just Getting Started Tour. Because I feel like I'm just getting started. And in, in in my life at this time in my life. And it has been wonderful. So the first tour was called the Big Panty Tour. Yeah. We had a ball, talked about my panties. Women brought panties, threw panties at me, just like I was Tom Jones. I did 100 cities. <laughs> and, um, and now when you did all these cities, like, does the husband come? What is his A lot role? of husbands come. No, your husband. Oh, no. He, we, he still working like a mule. Providing health insurance for us. No, if I go to the win or somewhere like that, he wants to go and play yeah. blackjack or if there's somewhere to play golf. But my no, husband he stays too. at home. He my stays at and home. my husband only, um, only if he comes, he always books like all the hotels and stuff. And then what? And then all of a sudden he'll come, and I'll be like, oh my god, like this hotel is so nice. How did we get such a? And then I realized it's because he's coming. <laughs> So he's booking like the nicest hotel room or not the nicest, but nicest for me. And uh, but yeah, like if it's yeah, if it's, you know, going to be kind of some fun or whatever. They're dating. I hate to say this in front of them, but when he does travel with me, he acts like it's our honeymoon and makes me do, you know, it all night. And I'm too tired. And I've got to get on a pair of Spanx and my eyelashes and and he's holding on to me, and I'm trying to get ready, and I'm breaking out in a sweat over my lip. I'm sorry. But it, he's got a lot of testosterone. And, That's good. That's yeah. Nice. Um, so so I, it's just too hard for me. I got, I've got to work. Yeah, it's, that's why you just have to be smarter about how you do it. And that's why I feel that, too, like in doing tours, like to be smarter about, okay, what's not going to exhaust me? Yeah. You know? Like, and, and sometimes when you've been kind of like selfless and you haven't always had the money, you're, you know, I, I finally was like, 
we need to book a professional driver to pick me up from the airport. I'm not going to drag my bags to the Uber lot and wait for the cheapest Uber. And, and I, that took and a I long still, time for me to do that, Yeah, to finally go. And I don't do that all the time. I don't get a driver all the time. I still kind of drag some stuff out to the Uber thing. <laughs> but, like, if, it's, if I'm in a big city and I'm scared, yeah. like, if I'm in New York, they get me a driver. Yeah. And I pay for that. Of course. It's so yeah. expensive. Yeah. And it's hard for me because I've got Chuck Morgan. Their daddy has always been a saver and it's been so stable. And see, yeah. I was the dreamer and I was like, oh, and he's the one that's been like saving for our retirement, got a yeah. 401k. Same with my husband. Yeah. Okay. So when I would be out with Southern Fried Chicks, for instance, yeah. they would say, let's go to Panera for breakfast. And I had Chuck Morgan in my ear going, eat that continental breakfast. That's free. Oh, so I yeah, would be there here. eating an old muffin. Oh my God. So my husband would go, he, wa- he would call me in the morning and wake me up because we're three hours ahead. I mean, he's, uh, we're, if I'm East Coast, he's, so he'd call me like at 930. And that means he set his alarm at 630 to call me to say, I got you a free breakfast. It's going to expire at 10. So will you please? And I'm like, oh, right. Like, no. And I just recently have I been like, I still will take advantage of a free breakfast. Who can't? But, um, <laughs> and I've have stolen like an orange and stuff. I have too. Like, I've always I, got something there yeah. to put in my purse. Yeah, later. yeah. And like in the, in the green room, like the snacks and stuff. Yeah. Oh, all the waters. The waters in the green room. I take the waters. I take all the waters in the Diet Cokes and yeah. I do too. Yeah. I do too, Hannah. And I still take uh, leftovers and stuff. And my kids are like, mom, if you, they got so mad at me about the leftovers thing. And then my sister, same thing. And I'm so now I've said, I go, I will only do now leftover if it's like a really good pasta or a steak. That's it now. Because those, I think, do last the next day. But, I mean, I would take every fucking, and I still do. It's still hard for me, too. And I'm like, Heather, I, we, I was with my I've son in everything. Mexico, and I got the buffet, and I couldn't finish the, no, no, no. I ordered a lox and avocado, like, toast, and I couldn't finish it. And I took it in the bag to the beach where it's hot, <laughs> getting hotter. And then we moved. To a different pet, to a different uh, lounge chair. And I carried it with me. And my son is like, whoa, I can smell that fish. I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I'm like, I look at it, the, the avocados are brown. And I go, God. But, you know, <laughs> it was like $28. I know. And I'm like, throw it away, you loser. Throw it away. I know. I do the same thing, Heather. I do the same thing. And when I started this big penny tour, you know, they have a writer and they have stuff yeah. back there, fruit and cheese and all. Yeah. So the um the guy that they put with me um with Outback Concerts, he started bringing Ziploc bags for me so that I could then take it yeah. and ride and put it in the hotel refrigerator and then get up the next morning and eat that cheese and that fruit. I've done that. And and then I got to think like the the people that work the whatever in the theaters, I think, wanted to eat that stuff. And we're like, you know, I think getting angry. That- well, then I realized, <laughs> then I realized, because then Peter goes through the contracts, my husband, and he, so now we're like, don't be getting me a tray for $200 that comes out of my final net. I will eat before I come. <laughs> All I need is some waters. Yeah. And how much are you going to charge for those waters? Because otherwise, I'll bring my, like, there's all those like hidden fees that you like didn't know. This isn't too getting boring. Okay, listen, I have another question. Your girls are here, your daughters are here. Uh-huh. And was there ever a time where the girls were like, I don't like that you told that story on stage or anything like that? Um, no, they've never said anything to me. My boy, when he was in, I think he was in fifth or sixth grade, he was going through puberty. And I was on local radio in Knoxville and on WIVK and pro- and couldn't, I mean, I was, I don't even know what I was on there for. I guess because I'm the only comedian out of Knoxville and they used to have me on all the time. Anyway, I was telling about him having like one little arm hair under this arm pit, but not under this one, something. And his voice was changing and um, he was already in school. They were already in class. One of his friends w- went to the orthodontist and was was riding home, riding to school with his mom after his orthodontist appointment and went in and told Charlie, your mom's talking about your puberty on WIVK. And he said to me after school, don't ever 
say anything like that again. And I felt terrible. And I went, I won't, I promise. So when they were in middle school, I tell everybody, that was a dry time for me. You know, middle school is a hard time for everybody. And I knew that they didn't, they were very self-conscious. And they didn't want me to say anything. I guess I really wasn't working that much when y'all were in middle school. Because that, that was, y'all were in, I was with Southern Fried Chicks when y'all were in elementary. And on Nick at Night when y'all were in elementary. And then middle school, I think I could barely get arrested. Nobody cared. And then when they were in high school, they were like, we don't care what you do. Like, you know, they were over me. I think that's really important because, like, I've talked about a lot about this, about a lot of people exposing every moment of their life because they're, like, TikTok influencer moms or whatever. And there's a big movement of, like, these kids don't have any say in it. You would if you were on a sitcom. You don't, you know, how much you're exposed or whatever. But the same thing goes with talking about your kids on stage or writing them out on a book or whatever. And um, I did talk about my kids in my special, but I said, but I always told my kids, you can't see my stand up till you're 16. And they're like, why? I go, because at 16, you won't care. And so then, yeah, they, they, they never saw what I said. Because yeah. like, if I tell a story about my son crying about his, you know, Hot Wheels car that, you know, fell in the toilet with a big poo. Like, I think that's really funny. But if he hears me tell that, like, and he was only eight and he was eight at the time, like, it's that. It's like, they, they don't, they don't get it. And like, recently my son told me like, you know, yeah, that would have been really hard if you were like a housewife or something while I was in middle school and because kids see everything and say everything. And especially like in Hollywood and how much people are sharing about their kids. I do think it's something to be kind of conscious of the age, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like that's talk the about the two-year-old, whatever, and talk about the 20-year-old. But it's, it is that, that age that, oh, my God, and especially if another kid hears about it. Oh, it was awful, and I never did it again. And, and the only time, and then, you know, now they're like, oh, my gosh, Mom, tell it. We don't care. Yeah, they, yeah. Y'all don't, don't, they don't care. Yeah. Okay, but my husband, one time, when I first got started, I, I have breast implants that are old and they've calcified and I need to get them out. But I breastfed all these three <laughs> children. Yeah. And I had to do something because while I nursed all those babies and they had just, they looked so bad and I yeah. still had life left in me. Anyway, I got these breast implants, but, but I started comedy before I got the breast implants and I said on stage something about I'd get breast implants, but it's been a bad mobile home year. And my husband said, heard it and said, don't you ever say that again. He said, you know that I've always taken care of you. I could write a check for those breast implants right now. <laughs> and he said, I, I, because he, you know, has been a, a wonderful provider. Right. So it, and he, like, and he, that, and that's his job and he takes it very seriously. And he said, don't ever say that I cannot provide for you because I can. And I was like, I was just saying, it's been a bad mobile home year. You know, that's like back then it was like $3,000 to get a breast implant surgery. But anyway, I said, I won't. I'll never say that again. And I've never said anything like that again. Yeah. And I got those. Then he wrote a check for my breast implants. And now, now they're old and decalcified. And he goes, nothing's wrong with those. And I go, yeah. I mean, they're, you know, 20 years old and 20-something years old. And they got to come out. And he's like, you know, he doesn't like spend money. He's like, oh, good Lord. You don't yeah. need any new ones. I go, really don't want any new ones, Chuck. <laughs> they're calcified. They're getting hard. They're huge. You know, well, whatever the doctor them. says, you know, do he what said the I needed them out. Okay. He said I need them out. And he said, I, I mess think, with that. Yeah. The he goes, with the it. skin, I think you need to put a small one back in. I didn't want to put anything in. He goes, I think you're going to need to put a small one in because it'll be a horror yeah. if you don't. But anyway, I don't have time. I don't have time to do that. I don't know when but, I'm ever going to do that. But I think that's, um, you know, I think that's interesting. And, you know, speaking of Roseanne, you know, um, yeah, I, I did meet her son. I did. I was, he had a radio show and I was on it like years ago. And I did ask him the same type of things. How did you ever feel about your mom? Like talking about you, whatever. And he said something great. He's like, well, it wasn't like my mom was out going to clubs and drinking. She was doing stand up. So, so they all I don't turned know. out okay. And everything I mean, was I don't fine. know what all the kids are doing. I know she just did a special. <laughs> so I know there's like, there's the three. And then she had the, the youngest with like, the you know the husband after tom arnold um oh, but i yeah. mean the three older ones the two girls and the boy i mean they must be you know in their 40s by now yeah so i but i don't know what they do but i'd love to know like yeah. you know um but yeah that's that's 
you know, it's interesting. And I wanted to get more in because I was like, then you went from like whatever being so middle class is so rich. What, what what could that have been like for for kids? You know? Oh, I know. Yeah, and then in the tabloids and like all that tabloid stuff that like, you know, you and I never had all that tabloid. Oh, stuff. I know. And Tom yeah. Arnold, all that. Yeah. Do the girls when you meet new people? Is it ever like, no way, that's your mom? Or what is that like? Hey, this is Maggie, <laughs> middle child. Um, yeah, I mean, oftentimes if it comes, I look a lot like my mom. And so a lot of times now people will say, I feel like I know you. Do they see you on her like uh, Instagram or anything? Yes. Yeah. Yes. My kids We're get recognized open. from that too. Yes, yeah. exactly. So that happens a lot pretty locally. But yeah, I mean, if it ever comes up, I mean, I've been all over traveling in the u.s and somehow it's come up and people are like no way there's no way and then they always ask how what was it like having a mom that's a comedian does your do your kids get yeah. that and what do you I'm say like, it's the best i mean she was i mean always mom first so she's funny but i feel like it was just the same i don't think i even realized she was a comedian until like people talked about her being a comedian and i knew it was unusual but it was the same as her working at target you know what yeah. i mean like she didn't talk about comedy i don't think right. we talked about it till i was maybe in high school Yeah. I, I mean, Nick at Night came and filmed y'all and all that, but it was but when y'all were like babies. But I was like seven. You know, yeah. I, didn't, I knew people came and filmed, but I never, I don't think I quite understood right. what it was or how unusual it was. Um, Plus, we were living in Knoxville. It's and not like we were in LA. Go, when you, you know? go and like go out to eat, like while you're here, like will you get recognized and what is that like for you guys? Yeah, I think, I think at first when we were growing up, because she was the only comedian, in Knoxville, there would be some local fans, you know, that would yeah. have heard her at a breast cancer awareness <laughs> thing or heard her at W, you know, on the radio. Um, but now everywhere we go, I'd say every single place we go, she gets recognized. And at first I thought, oh, my gosh, my, I'd get butterflies and feel like I was getting recognized. And now it's kind of become the normal. But it's so sweet. Her fans are so sweet and see and her exactly what we see, you know, and how special she is. So I think it just. Oh, my God. It's so, so sweet. sweet. <laughs> Today's her birthday. She's yeah. 27. That's why she's here with me this week. So I if I knew I'd be on camera, I wish I would have worn something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell everybody where they can. You have a special out or coming out. Uh, it, Netflix, April the 11th. I'm Every Woman is what it's called. And then um, I'm on my new tour, Just Getting Started Tour. It's 100 cities all over the United States. And that's uh, LeahMorgan.com. We're about to announce the um fall dates Great. and um yeah and it's fun and i'm having a good time and i'm doing some small arenas wow that's amazing i'm so happy for you thank you heather yeah i, I mean, mean i just think it's it every day i think what in the world is about to happen now and and my book that's coming out in 2024 is called what in the world because I, um i just feel like i mean every day is just a miracle of things that are happening and I and I even though I felt like this, it feels right to me. I knew something was going to happen, but I just didn't know it was going to be this. And it's so much sweeter and better than what I imagined. Yes, because I'm in front of these women every night, and they're and husbands are with them, but it's a majority of women. Right. But I look out there and I think, you know what? I'd be best friends with all of them in every right. town. I think, oh yeah, my gosh, they're totally. my. We would have a ball. We got a jazzercise. Yeah. We'd have a bowl. Leanne, I have to go. Darn it. And I, I want, there's so much you. I want to talk well, about. Well, let's hang out more. This I has been amazing. I would love it, Heather. You angel I love from it. heaven. I'll get your, your details of when your shows are in L.A. and stuff. Anyway, everybody, Leanne Morgan, special Netflix. April the 11th. You'll love it. I Follow hope her do. so that you know when she comes to your town and you buy the tickets. Love you. Anyways, don't forget to check out all of my new shows that are coming up this summer. You go to heathermcdoll.net, get your tickets. It will sell out. Make your fun summer plans. I'm going to a bunch of cities, Las Vegas, San Diego, Napa, Irvine, Red Bank, New Jersey, Connecticut, Hampton, Sacramento, and San Francisco. And then after that, I don't know. So get your tickets for those now at heathermcdoll.net. Thanks, guys.